So this year, I watched 500 movies, around 500. At this point, at time of this recording, I've watched uh, this many. And I just wanted to go through some thoughts, reflect on this year, talk about some of the movies that I liked, talk about things that I learned, and things that I definitely, definitely didn't. So a few stats to start things off. At the time of this recording, I watched about 520 films. Of them, 122 were from the 2020s. Uh, too many, in my opinion. The most represented year was probably from 2022, or maybe it m might not have been, but I watched 58 movies from this year. The most recently released movie that I watched was Pinocchio. The oldest movie that I watched was from 1924. Yeah, 1924. Of these, how many did I see in theaters? 20... Around 20 in movie theaters, and the rest on my phone or on my laptop. This is how many I watched on my laptop. This is how many I watched on my phone. This is how many I watched on a plane. Uh, I watched movies from America, France, Japan, Iran, Germany, Argentina, England, Taiwan, China, West Germany, uh, and whichever others I've forgotten here. Um, uh, the longest movie that I watched was 803 minutes, and the shortest one I watched was one minute. I want to start by saying that watching a lot of films does not necessarily make you a better film watcher or an informed film watcher. Most importantly, it doesn't necessarily make you an informed film watcher. The easiest example I could draw is every single critic that you disagree with, whether in print media or online. Critics watch a lot of movies, and while the number of movies that they watch perhaps at times better equips them to understand or discuss films better than the average moviegoer, it does not grant them authority on understanding films. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of examples of critics that you disagree with or letterbox users that just endlessly log movies that they watch. The important thing isn't necessarily volume, although it's good to have volume. There are trade-offs to having volume, I'd say, and I'll get into that. But what is necessary in addition to volume is intentionality, is a degree of thoughtfulness as well. You could equate this to any number of things. This is like um, exercise, this is like food, this is like culture, this is like religion. There are plenty of things that you could do daily, that you could practice habitually, and you will not necessarily improve on it unless you couple that habit with a degree of intentionality or thoughtfulness. So watching 500 movies, uh, if all of the movies were blockbusters, were Marvel movies, if, if they were just Marvel movies, for example, that already takes up 30 movies in a year. If I were to watch just Marvel movies this year, that would already account for 80 to 100 hours of watch time. If I were to only watch Family Guy episodes this year, that would already account for 80 hours of watch time. Volume does not equate to sophistication, and it does not equate to the development of one's tastes. The way I kind of think of it, I kind of think that uh, movies are kind of like food. So you can eat it for sustenance, and you can eat it to explore. And you could have good tastes or bad tastes, but mostly it's just your own tastes. But something you can use as like a benchmark for how much you necessarily agree with somebody else's tastes is how much diversity they actually introduce into their diet. So if you're taking criticism from a person who only eats chicken nuggets every single day and says that anything outside of the scope of chicken nuggets is objectively bad or objectively poor made, um, 70% of the time, 90% of the time, your taste may align with them because chicken nuggets are really good. But that other 10%, that other 30% equates to a massive, massive hole in their perspective because they just don't try out things other than chicken nuggets. And so part of what I was aiming for when I was watching all these movies was to try and explore new things, try and work outside of my tastes. I There are aspects in which I kind of fell into my old habits, of course. There's no helping that. There, there are more social genres, I'd say, or genres better fit for other people or genres that I don't gel with entirely. I have such a supremely hard time watching uh, comedies in volume. That's just me. I just don't like watching comedies a lot. And I, when I do watch comedies, I would prefer to watch them with other people. And the movies that I already do watch, I think of as having a degree of 
comedic intention behind them anyways. You know, people don't necessarily consider Ingmar Bergman to make comedies, and he obviously doesn't, but there's a certain kind of social awkwardness or uh, pathology in his films that make you so uncomfortable that you can't help but read a degree of humor into it. Uh, the humor of human connection, of human uh, discord. Here's some genres I really got into while watching these. I really got into Gainsborough Pictures. Gainsborough was a movie studio in England back in like the 1930s and 40s. They made a lot of melodramas, a lot of costume dramas, uh, the sort of stuff that you'd expect to see in like a soap opera or something if it was made by England. And they're really appealing. They're really fun. They're swashbuckling. They're a little bit seedy. They're a little gossipy. Basically, bad women and hot men being excessively rude <laughs> is a genre unto itself, but very, very appealing and very dig very digestible. Uh, this year, I also really got into exploring Japanese films outside of the standard practice. You know, we kind of think of Japanese films as uh, samurai films or as Akira Kurosawa Sometimes it's one and the same. Uh, this year, I really got into exploring Japanese cinema as like a progressive history with different movements kind of reacting or interpreting the ones that had come previous to, to them. I had no idea, for example, and you could flame me on this, but I had no idea that pink films existed before this year. So it was really interesting exploring that genre. I, I might get into more of that in the coming year. It was really instructive to watch a bunch of old Japanese films and really get into a sense of pace and how Japanese films, can, uh, filmmakers of that time conceptualized uh, narrative. It's very, very s slow in comparison to American films and even American films of that time, but especially American films of today. And that pace, whether endemic of Japanese culture at large or individual filmmakers, helps kind of reset your clock, um, kind of clue you into a different way of viewing and understanding the world. The kind of easiest analog I can think of for most traditional Western movie viewing audiences would be like watching Tarkovsky for the first time and having those films kind of reset your clock and your understanding of how, how movies can approach narrative, time, and linearity. I also took a trip to Japan this year, and so I got to watch some recent films from 2022. And they did obvious, obviously don't have any subtitles for English-speaking viewers, so I, I was sitting down watching this drama unfold of an old man uh, spending the winter in a ro remote outpost, tending to his garden and collecting root vegetables to prepare over the course of an entire winter. It was very slow, it was very methodical, but it was very instructive sitting in that space and feeling that different interpretation of time, living in the moment, and appreciating silence. Also, Japanese audiences are really, really quiet. American audiences are very loud. I think, for me, uh, horror movies were probably the easiest movie to watch within uh, different settings. Like, if I, had to, if I wanted to watch a movie in the theater, horror was a really easy choice. If I wanted to throw something on the uh, phone while I was cooking or something, or taking a walk, horror was pretty easy in those settings as well. I found it harder, definitely, to watch foreign films while I was on the phone or, like, doing something else. This is not an example of perfect movie watching. Obviously, if you're watching 500 movies within a year, it's not going to represent the ideal circumstances of <clears throat> the ideal circumstances of watching a movie in a cinema and taking it all in and sitting in a padded seat and really kind of drinking in the atmosphere. Uh, I had that experience with some movies. I, as a personal choice don't really uh, value the in-cinema experience too much. That's definitely a bias that I subscribe to. I'd rather watch a movie anywhere than watch it in a specific setting. Some pluses I'll say for watching movies in the theaters, it definitely made the worst movies Jeez. better. Uh, I'll say that. I'd say that it raised average experiences higher, but with a few Notable exceptions, it didn't make anything completely stellar or transformative, and that's just an experience I've had in theaters in general. I like seeing movies in theaters, but generally just like blockbusters or horror movies, and uh, while I can appreciate the big screen for important or intelligent contemplative films, I, like I wa like watching movies at IFC if I can help it or Film Forum, American audiences are very loud, and exhibition settings... Uh, the settings of different theaters are not ideal in any circumstances. And so 
while you think that watching In the Mood for Love at IFC would be a transformative experience, or watching World of Wong Kar Wai at IFC would be a transformative experience, it, it isn't always. I could tell you that from experience. <laughs> One of my like most instructive experiences of watching movies in a theater as an adult was watching Lawrence of Arabia a year ago at a, at a Museum of Moving Images. And not only was the print they had, not stellar it was 70 millimeter but it was not stellar but uh watching lawrence of arabia with a contemporary audience is an exercise in futility and humiliation uh just like turning your heart cold to the world because <laughs> let me tell you they're gonna awkwardly laugh through the torture scene and while that may be the process necessary for them to kind of understand and digest the film it's kind of a horrible experience for somebody who already likes the film uh, i'll say for the modes in which i watched it there are really obvious blind spots to it i'm like only half paying attention to half of these films it's not ideal circumstances you can flame me for that like half of these movies i probably watched with one eye on the screen that's that's pretty obvious but I, I kind of subscribe to the version of watching movies that, like, um, as long as you're getting something out of it, like, I, I think of film watching, for me, the experience that I like, as, like, Martin Scorsese having um, a little TV in his office that plays TCM all day long, and he can just, like, check on the screen every once in a while and say, oh, this is what that filmmaker's doing, or I, I remember watching this when I was a kid in, in Mulberry Street or whatever, or, like, Ingmar Bergman watching three movies a day every single day, which is crazy to me because he's, like, he, like, actually worked as well, but apparently that guy watched around 900 to 1,000 movies a year. I'd love to see his letterbox. And yeah, I'd rather cast a wide net and try and like uh, pick up different things, different like small kernels from around the world or from different times than have a really prescriptive lens through which to view, view films that you only can have, you can only watch the best films ever made and you only watch movies that uh, represent the highest order and represent the best caliber. I think that's a really fast way to dig yourself into a hole and stay there for a long time. Having said that, item number two, three, 17, uh, something that I experienced from watching all of these movies is that the greatest of movies are very clearly greatest of. They are much, 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 much better than the average film. Um, so I understand that if you're compiling a greatest of list or your favorite movies list, if you want to put The Godfather at the top, if you want to put The Conversation or Goodfellas or The Umbrellas to Sherberg, like, I really won't hold it against you. I, I personally don't feel you need to be so elitist about this and think that, you know, filmmakers putting or critics putting their best of lists for sight and sound or for end of the year polls need to um, need to focus on the most obscure or the most tasteful choices. I think that's good for highlighting obscure works, but if you like the best, it's not harming anybody. You're not killing anybody by saying your one of your favorite movies is um, Empire, The Empire Strikes Back. I think there's a really clear divide between movies that are really thoughtfully made and really expressly made and made with passion and with artistic intent from movies that are being generally made. Um, I think one of the best examples for that this year, from my experience, was The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. Like, that movie just shot through the screen. It was so incisive. It was so razor sharp in how clear uh, of a filmmaker Fassbender clearly was. And you could just feel it emanating off of the screen. And so I wouldn't begrudge anybody who says that The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant is one of their favorite movies of all time. It's really easy to say that. Having said that, on your greatest of lists, like, after a certain point, then it just becomes a matter of taste. So I'd say that the movies that are well-made are very clearly well-made in comparison to a majority of films. And after that, it's a matter of cultivating your own taste, seeing what you really like, what you you really resonate with. I see like people making uh, best filmmakers of the 21st century lists all the time. People put some filmmakers on that list that I wouldn't personally resonate with. Uh, I put some filmmakers on that list that other people might find uh, hilarious. Like, 
I think if I put Celine Sciamma on that list, that a majority of people who have seen Celine Sciamma films would agree with me, but a contingency of people would find her work prosaic or just not heady or not aspiring to the levels that they aim for, and that's fine. That's a matter of taste at, at that at that point. Other stuff that I want to I, I want to I would want to highlight from this list. I would generally say just watch older movies if you can. Find like the oldest movie that you could bear and work work your way out in increasing gyres. Like uh, if you're not used to watching older films, you could watch the classic older films because they're usually great. And if you've developed a curiosity past that, watch older movies that aren't necessarily in the canon, aren't necessarily The Wizard of Oz or Gone with the Wind or Casablanca I'd say watch foreign movies definitely definitely explore your borders on foreign movies expand into French movies Japanese movies watch Polish movies I sincerely (laughs) would stress this to you watch Polish movies watch Swedish movies watch Iranian movies watch Georgian movies a big blind spot for me right now, obviously, would be African-based films, films by the African diaspora. Um, I'm going to try and work on that, certainly. But watching movies from another country is like going on vacation without having to pay for it or without having to pay exorbitantly for it. You get to see another culture through their own lens. You may not understand all of it, but it really helps to kind of reframe your understanding of what narrative is, of what drama is, of what cultural perspectives or priorities are, of what like human priorities are. It's just great in general to see movies from a different perspective. One I would definitely suggest for that, that was like the most like differentiated from my general uh, worldview was definitely Dry Summer. Dry Summer is a really, uh, it's a film made from a different, a whole different civilization or a whole different era. Another fun thing I would suggest that is um, if you're watching a movie these, these days and if you mainly watch movies that have been made in the past 10 years, chances are you're watching a remake or a sequel and that's something to build off of. If you're, if you're watching a remake and you haven't seen the original, watch the original. If you're watching a sequel and you haven't seen the uh, prequel or the first installation, do that. And if you've done all of those things, you should try out, you should check out the director's other works. I think this is like a big blind spot for a lot of people who watch movies that um, they'll be introduced to a director and want to watch their subsequent work, but sometimes have a bit of a blind spot for the director's previous works. That stuff can be really instructive in how a director develops their tastes. It can really give you insight into what their focuses are, what their manias are, what their preoccupations are. And it's really fun sometimes, sometimes to chart the evolution of uh, like Christopher Nolan being like, a, am going to be an intelligent noir boy to I want to set off a nuclear bomb and film it. <laughs> Another thing I'd say that was helpful for me and my experience to to better enjoy movies when I was watching them is to not read up too much about them. When I was picking these movies, usually it was kind of like out of a hat or just based on like a log line or a still photo or just some aspect of it that kind of appealed to me. And I resisted the temptation to like look up reviews or to look up critical analyses of, mo- of the movies before I watched them. I tried to do this in general, but not reading critics reviews helps me come into a movie fresh and not so bogged down by previous commentary or previous discourse on a movie. I think we can get really bogged down by established opinion on movies and it can really color your viewing. Like what's a movie from this year that everybody kind of hated? Oh, for example, this year I really loved Elvis. I'm not afraid to admit that. Elvis has caused a lot of discourse both ways. And something that was really helpful for me in watching it was to not have that discourse on my plate when I went in to watch it. I think generally you should take like a filmmaker or a film on its own terms, at least for the first viewing. And so going in with those kind of fresh eyes and seeing a movie on its own terms will help you enjoy a movie more or will help you settle on your opinion on a film better. It could help you hate a movie more than other people. But if you want to read up on stuff on a movie, I suggest doing it afterwards. I get like going to a theater costs 20 bucks. You don't want to waste money on a movie that'll turn out to be bad. But even a bad film can be instructive. I forgot who said that. It might have been Herzog. But somebody somebody somewhere, some effect said that 
watching because a bad they film can be, be more inspiring. He said they said it as like a filmmaker, but as a viewer as well. Just whatever happens to kind of define your tastes and to see what you really like. If I were to take critical opinion on every Jacques Demy movie, I would assume that he had made two and a half good movies and the rest are completely unremarkable or failed attempts. Uh, I, I, I don't think that at all when I watch his movies. That's my taste speaking. That's my bias. But at least it's an opinion that I form for myself watching the movies and engaging with the movies directly and not taking somebody else's opinion and using it as a kind of objective benchmark. I think I... I I, s- I heard a quote recently from uh, Leonardo that it's better to engage no with curiosity and with direct experience than any sort of authorial judgment. I'll put the quote in. It's probably a better phrase than what I just said. Or like 3,000 years of longing. You, you're allowed to hate 3,000 years of longing upon your initial viewing of it, but I wouldn't let critics, I wouldn't let people on the internet certainly i wouldn't let people on letterboxd or your friends dissuade you from watching three thousand years of longing and formulate formulating your own opinion on it or stars at noon certainly or or crimes of the future or flux gourmet or men uh people have terrible terrible opinions on horror movies uh because it's easy to hate on a horror movie it's easy to dunk on a movie especially a genre movie as like not meeting certain expectations or not bearing up to a certain threshold for movies like crimes of the future or e- or flux gourmet or men or especially like stars at noon they are not made with those standards or that threshold or that perspective in mind they're made for different reasons and when you watch them i'm not saying you have to but when you watch them it is a more fulfilling experience to try and watch them on their own terms as opposed to something that an objective film critic might tell you is a standard that they're not meeting that is a supremely boring way to watch movies jesus christ so yeah that was 500 movies what are what are some that i would recommend bitter tears of petrified cat definitely uh oh yeah let's do a list of ones that i would recommend oh shit without without trying to recommend every single one in the world okay closely observed trains closely observed trains is great i think adoption is great Ooh. Uh, from the from Ealing from uh, Gainsborough Pictures, Man in Gray is great. Fanny by Gaslight is okay. And what's the really good one? The really good one is uh, The Wicked Woman. But uh, James Mason, Phyllis Calvert, uh, Stuart Granger, he's a hottie. If you want to see a 30s hottie, you should see Stuart Granger in movies. Exhibition is really great. Um, I know people talk about Joanna Hogg for like the uh, souvenir movies, but Exhibition is great. Odd Man Out. Another Mason. Uh, I saw a Japanese series on Kinio Tanaka back in the summer at Lincoln Center, and all those movies were great. She's an astounding filmmaker, an astounding actress, and it was really, it was really revivifying seeing filmmaking and stories from her perspective, especially seeing uh, war and conflict from her her perspective. Because before then, I didn't really conceptualize war as like, because you know, stupidly, we kind of gender everything, and you're weirdly gendered brain doesn't think that like women participate or experience war at the same level as men and that's patently ridiculous most filmmakers who make movies about war have not participated in war as soldiers and most of the filmmakers who make movies about war have not experienced war and there's a certain generation of filmmakers who experience war and made films about them and they are not demarcated by gender you should watch all of their movies Mouth Agape is tremendous. Mouth Agape is one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. It's deeply personal. We've had all these movies this year, and in the previous year of like directors kind of showing their ass a little bit, not in a bad way, but directors kind of engaging in autobiography and telling like facets of their life, like Fablemans, uh, Belfast, a Souvenir, uh, Pain and Glory. Mouth Agape is about the director's own experiences with um, cancer in his family, and yeah just the experience of his watching his mother have cancer and that sounds really 
you know, heavy, and it is, something that's, like, really refreshing and bracing about it and honest about it is, like, for a majority of the movie, the exhibited behavior of the family is, like, not caring, is, like, trying to ignore the mother who is dying in the room upstairs because if they had to face that aspect of their lives every single day, they would melt. Uh, a good companion piece to that is Dick Johnson is Dead. That's a good documentary. The Lost World is incredible. I can't believe a movie from like the 1920s had such good practical effects. If you've never seen The Lost World, the dinosaur movie, I really love dinosaurs, but um, you should check it out. Prayers for the Stolen, pra- Prayers for the Stolen, and the Girl and the and the uh, the Girl and the Spider were my favorite movies from 2021. You should definitely check those out. Iphigenia. I forgot how it's actually pronounced in the movie. The Mahalis Kakuyanis movie. It's if you like Greek tragedy, it's about. Ephiania at Alvis. <laughs> a real young girl is really good. I don't know if I would recommend it. We'll get into Catherine Braya on this channel next year. Limiche. Limiche is beautiful. I think I've talked about it in a previous, movie, uh, previous video, but Limiche is beautiful. Thriller is disgusting. <laughs> it's a great watch. It's disgusting. Uh, Judex is great. Judex is slick as hell. Judex is like a heist movie and like a, a supervillain movie made by in France in like the 1960s by like France by uh, Georges Franjou, the guy who made Eyes Without a Face, and it's just sleek as hell. Just like it's a cool movie. Dry Summer. Dry Summer is tremendous. Uh, what country is it from? Yeah, Turkish. It's a tremendous, tremendous movie. <laughs> I may I might make a video on this. Uh, Seventh Veil is really good. Uh, 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 I'll get into this later, but I'm a huge James Mason fan, and Seventh Veil is really good. Most of the comedies I watched were like from the 1930s. I like the comedies from the 1930s and 40s, I guess. Celine's really good. Uh, Azur from last year. Uh, it's an Argentinian or a s- uh, uh, Swiss film, maybe. But just like bleak as hell, bleak as hell. Uh, take a country that is falling into fascism, that is um, perpetrating mass executions and kidnappings of its citizenry, um, and put that all within the cloak or context of like capitalist ventures. It's about a Swiss banker going to Argentina it, um, during the throes of a coup, and he's trying to repair relations with the important clients after the disappearance of one of their kind of head uh, account man and it's basically like all backdoor schemes and deals and conspiracies without ever talking about what's going on directly it's magnificent <laughs> uh check out taiwanese new cinema if you can if you have the propensity for it it's a bit slow but a movie that I would recommend watching once and then watching again is That Day on the Beach, the debut film of Edward Yang. It's it's a lot. It's it's a it's a lot about the kind of failures of marriage, of institutions, these uh, set goals that we have growing up that we think will guide us to a happy and fulfilling life, and seeing these institutions um, and expectations not meeting up with reality and the gulf that that lies in that distance and the gulf that lies between a husband and a wife and not ever being able to truly know another person um something that pervades in a lot of the movies that i like from this year or from the year of the movies that i watched is like the unknowable about another person we can't know why another person will explode we don't know why another person will disappear it's a harrowing narrative that we'll, we'll never know what's at the heart of the people that we most trust and are most intimate with. And that is shown in a lot of the movies that I really liked. So that's that's an idea to explore in some of the movies that you watch. Um, yeah, that was my year in film. 500 movies, 522 by today's count. Hopefully you got something from this long rambling mess. Yeah. How many times did I get laid this year?